Paolo Caravano. I am a student at Scientific High School of Foligno. And I'm here to introduce Stavros Katsanevas, who is a brilliant physicist of our time, one of the most brilliant physicists of our time. He was born uh, in Athens in 1953, and now is a professor at uh, University of Paris uh, the seventh. Uh, he is the direct. He also is the director of the Astroparticle Physics and Cosmology Laboratory and the chairman uh, of the Astroparticle Physics uh, European Consortium. He won the Physics Prize for, uh, from the Academy of Athens, and uh, he was awarded two years ago, three years ago, uh, the National Order of Merit of, Merit of France. In this lecture, is going to uh, speak about the universe in function of time. Is going to explain uh, the conception of time in the description of the evolution in the universe. So he's going to describe the evolution of the universe since it was a point. Uh, so time and the universe are the main theme of this lecture. So I finished uh, uh, giving him an applause. Thank you. Eh, grazie. Il mio italiano è un po' approssimativo, allora uh, non, vole uh, non voleva distruggere la lingua, la bella lingua d'Italia, allora parlerò in, in inglese con uh, slides in francese e un accento greco. Allora sarà, sarà europeo. Vogliamo, cominciamo. So, I want to talk to you about uh, scales of time. Scales meaning that it's, we don't have a unique conception of what time is in the universe. We have different uh, uses of time in the, uh, in the very small and different uses of time in the very big in cosmology. So I will try to show these things and I will try to show how we try to unify them. My talk We'll start exactly like that, try to say a few things about uh, time in macrophysics, then time in microphysics, and try to show what it means for cosmology. I have a part where I very fast I explain to you how the end of structure in the universe will happen, but I'm afraid since there is another lecture, I will not have time to go. We might have a time to do it since it's a catastrophe film. It's a film that ends badly. Uh, it's, it will be only a trailer so that you get, as they have in the cinema, a trailer so that you get an image. And then the last thing I will do is I will try to spend one minute or two minutes on something that I got myself from this study. That was a, it's a new lecture that I prepared for you. It's the first time I'd give it. And try to understand what is time and how it relates to physics. And this is what I got, and the thing I got, I will give you in the last fragment. The last fragment, the last slide, which is the, actually the first fragment of philosophy by Anax Anaximander. So the first fragment we have from philosophy, who is coming from Anaximander. I also put this picture here, which is a Renaissance painter showing the, the scale, the ladder of Jacob in the Genesis. I will explain to you why I put it, but later. Let's start from macrophysics. Let's start from the common time we all have, which is actually what uh, Newton and Galileo had. You can find in the first phrase of uh, Principia, in the scolium, in the first phrases, in the first scolia of uh, Principia, it says, the absolute time, true and mathematical, in itself, from its own nature, flows uniformly without a relation to anything exterior. This is a very big statement. It's a very strong and bold thing for someone that, if you remember, he said, hypothesis non fingo, I don't make hypothesis. This is a huge hypothesis that beyond what we call time between ourselves, there is a time outside there flowing eternally mathematically. The, he felt the same thing for space. Although this was a, clearly an extrapolation. He knew from Galileo that the laws of physics are the same, whether you are on the shore or on a boat, 
And actually what you have to do is to add the velocities of the boat to the velocity of the object in the boat if you want to measure it from outside. This is what we call Galilean relativity. If you have this, you can start thinking, is there something else? Is there another space outside the, these two spaces, the space of the shore, the space of the boat, with respect to which these two things move? He, they did not make this thing, thinking. Then came another philosopher, Leibniz. He was then, he was a minority. Nobody sort of followed his opinion. But these days, is more like uh, an idea that we follow. He said, for me, I think that space is something that is purely relational, like time. It is an order of coexistence, as the time is an order of succession. This time is a minimum of time. What you say is that you can have synchronization between different processes and you can arbitrarily call one the clock and the other what tries to measure with respect to the clock. It doesn't go to a time, an absolute time, beyond. Currently, our theories of string theories start saying that the time and space are emergent properties of the objects. Without the objects, there are no space and no time. It's like the color, if you wish, or the order of things. Space and time is their properties. So you have these two conceptions of time. The one, time, space and time as a stage, as theatrical stage, as in the previous slide I showed you. It's uh, a phrase from Shakespeare. The world is a stage. You enter, you do your thing, you go out. In the Leibniz, there is no theater. It's only the actors. And the actors relate, the game of the actors creates space and time. So you have another phrase here about it. And of course, this conception opens the possibility of multiple words, which I will not go because we have, don't have time. Now, this classical conception with Maxwell electromagnetism got a blow because in electromagnetism, you cannot add the velocities as you add velocities with a boat. The, the, the speed of light is always the speed of light, the same. Whether you are running, you flash a light. Whether you, it, you are in a boat or you are outside the boat, it will be the same speed. Can, you do not, you do not uh, respect Galilean relativity. This is what Einstein took. And then if you take that, you say speed of light is one thing that is always the same, then you immediately have to rearrange space and time, and even call them together space-time. You have here one famous uh, example. If you have Pierre and Paul, one on the train station and the other on the train, then two lightnings hit the two edges of the train. The light will take some time equals, for, the, for Paul, who is standing at the train station, it will be a synchronous event that happened, the two lightnings, because it will take equal time to reach to him. But for Pierre, that was traveling, he would first meet the signal from the one and then from the other. For the, for the other, no, for Pierre, it would not be synchronous. So synchronicity is not something that exists. There is not a, a universal time. It is a time that is relative to what your frame of reference. Are you moving or you're not moving? If you start doing that, you start doing many other things, for instance, even the lapses of time became longer when you are running and things like that, well known in relativity. I don't want to go to that. So he gave the first blow to absolute time. Furthermore, we know now that if you want to, uh, to do relativity, you have to consider space and time as four dimensions that are linked together. There is very, this very poetic phrase by Minkowski, who says, henceforth, space by itself and time by itself are doomed to fade away into mere shadows, beautiful, and only a kind of union of the two will survive. And you have an image of that just below. The fact that the velocity of light is the highest speed separates the universe in three parts. First, 
all the events in the past that can influence you, these are the cone behind, in the future are all the events that you can influence, and all around, elsewhere, is where you cannot connect to them, because if you had to connect with them, you had to connect with a speed that it is higher than the speed of light. And this you cannot do. So, let's take it for the universe. We are once more at the center of the universe. Why we are at the center of the universe? Because signals come from us from all over the place, and actually they come from the past. They come from this cone behind of us. So you have them all around us, and the past is not anymore. Since there is no flow of time which is uni uniform and universal, the past is not behind us, it is around us. And this is a very interesting thing. By studying as we do these days, you can reach, if you go far enough, you go, go and study the beginning of the universe, because it surrounds you. It's the, the beginning of the universe sends messages that come today, as we speak, in your television set, as we will say, from the beginning of the universe. Our past surrounds us. I even found a very nice fra uh, phrase in French, which I will translate because I know uh, also the people, uh, they both know French. She says uh, somewhere, uh, Marcel Proust, in the time, temps retrouvé, car ces résurrections du passé, dans la seconde qu'elles durent, forcent notre personne tout entière à se croire entourée par eux. Beautiful. Let's come now what will become 100 years old uh, in, uh, uh, in next year. General relativity. I put here an equation. Don't be afraid by it. I often say that talking about physics without showing equations is like talking about art without showing any painting. So this is an equation. This is the equation of Einstein. And on the left side, you have what characterizes the geometry and on the right side, you have the density of energy and mass. And what Einstein says is that your energy and the mass deforms space around you. Then when you know the geometry, in fact, you know mass and energy. And when you know mass and energy, in fact, you know geometry. This we will use a lot to understand what the universe is. It also gives an explanation why two bodies are attracted. One falls, if you, went, if you wish, into the, uh, the uh, let's say, the, uh, how is it in, it's, it falls in, as you see here, falls inside the, the uh, dump that created the mass around it. The mass deformed and the other one falls in it. And that's attraction. That's the explanation of the attraction is this. So, he also put there, because he also believed at the time that there is, the universe is a static one. So he put a constant just to equilibrate his equations. He called it the cosmological constant. When we discovered the expansion of the universe, he said, this is my biggest mistake. But you will see it was not. Now, general relativity does many things to time. First of all, the clocks. Uh, have different ticking, go slower when they are in big gravitational, in big uh, gravitational fields. So again, no universal time. It depends on how, I mean, if you wish my, my watch, if I'm a little bit fatter than you, will be running slower. So, so it's really, time becomes related to the environment of mass and energy. Mass also starts deviating light. And it can deviate it so much if it, you have a, a very big mass that the light will, go, will not go away, will fall on itself. And this is what we call a black hole. So has things like that that does it. And the second and last equation that you will see is the following. This, Einstein believed that the universe was static. But then other theorists, De Sitter, Friedman, said, why should it be static? It can be in expansion. How can we write the equation so that it is in expansion? And then Lemaitre, a Belgian priest, proposed uh, an, the first idea of Big Bang, the primordial atom, as an explosion from a beginning to show the origin of cosmic rays. 
So the equation, as you have it here, says the following. If A is how the distance between two objects changes with time, it's derivatively, if you, how fast this thing changes, will depend on the mass and the energy, which is rho, will depend on the geometry of the universe, because the universe is not necessarily a flat surface, a flat meaning that you have the Euclidean uh, theorem. It can be a sort of structures that are called Riemannian structures, can be sort of in three dimensions, in four dimensions, it can be a sphere or can be a hyperbola. So depending on the geometry, depending on the mass, and depending on the cosmological constant, not only you, you define the geometry, you define the future. So you have below this three, you have how the universe, for instance, if we suppose on the left, here up, really at the very left, if we suppose that there was no cosmological constant and this, uh, the universe was, had a spherical uh, form, after some time it will collapse again to a point and it would go again and again and again. But we will see it is not like that. The, what we think now, and we believe that we have measured that, that it is flat, and that there is a cosmological constant or something that resembles to that, and that it is more like the third plot that you see at the right. But we'll come back to that. So the future of the universe is determined from its geometry, its content in mass, and of course, it's the cosmological constant. So then around the 30s, Hubble discovered that all the galaxies are receding from us. They do not only recede, but the farther they are, the faster they recede. They go farther and farther. So if you write this in the equation H, V over R, you see that there is a constant. You see that the relationship is a linear constant. So this is the inverse of a time. If it is the inverse of the time, this is the time that all these galaxies were together, were at the same point. This is a discovery of the age of the universe. If the, the universe was at some, you know, if every galaxy recedes from you with some speed, and if the, the ratio of the speed over the distance is constant, then everything goes together at some point and at some time. And this was the discovery of this. You have to understand also something that people do not understand very often, is that it is not, we do not all galaxies not go away from a single point. It's not like an explosion. It's what we call in English conflagration, confl probably in French, conflagration, which means that every point goes away from all the other points. If you are in our galaxy, you will see the galaxies receding with different speeds. If you are on another galaxy, you will see the same. We will not only see us going away from a point. Everybody goes away from everybody else. So Dyson <coughs> said something when they discovered that. He said, if the universe was static and universal, it was not static, it was static, the universe was static, we would never have existed here because thermalization, that is the radiation that permeates the universe, would have destroyed all structure. It's only because it's expanding that structure can exist. And I also found, I have also an example from Greek philosophy, very funny uh, saying by Pythagoras, who says that he, they believe that actually the, the uh, vacuum comes from outside and separates objects. It's like a pre-hint of this, of this thing we're calling expansion of the universe. Even better, or even worse, the universe is not only an expansion, it is an accelerated expansion. We recently understood that it even accelerates. And this probably is this cosmological constant we were telling. Then we discovered that the visible matter, the matter that shines, is not all the matter that there is other matter in the universe that does not shine, but we can infer its existence from the movement of the visible matter. And this is very interesting. And this shows us that there is even matter that we, don't, we don't, have not seen yet. And it's not the famous uh, black holes, it's something else. And we can see this matter because, as we said, gravitation 
deviates light. So if you have matter, even if it is visible, it will deviate the light. And you have phenomena as the one you see here. You have rings in the sky, which is essentially a galaxy behind that it is lensed by matter and creates a ring. So, yes. So, my colleague in his, his office is, uh, I'm proud to have him a few, uh, a few offices further down from my, from my, my own office, uh, George Smoot, that took the Nobel Prize for discovering what we'll say immediately afterwards, said, look, here in the beginning of 21st century, it's like the beginning of the 20th century. We know very well the overall structure of the universe, as I will try to persuade you, but we lack the understanding of its microphysics, as I will also try to, to tell you. And let me go now to that, the microphysics. <coughs> Again, in the beginning of the, the thing that may started what we call quantum mechanics in the beginning of the, of the last uh, century, was the problem of the black body. Black body is a body, it's all black in physics, usually black, uh, dark matter, uh, etc. This is a different black. Black body is a body that it has its temperature, uh, emits, it emits as much radiation that characterizes its own te temperature. And it can absorb all uh, things like that. But I don't want the, the, the complete definition, I don't think you're interested. And by studying this, he discovered that these black bodies emit uh, radiation, not in continuous, as it could be a wave, but like little packets. And the fact that it was little packets meant that it was what we call now this day like particles. For the light was a particle. Uh, it had particle, uh, and we called it photons. So the first thing that happened is we discovered that light becomes something like, uh, light becomes something like a particle. The second thing we discovered is that particles, when you, for instance, make, uh, uh, so you have uh, some uh, 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 two slits, the particles is as if they went through both slits at the same time. They produce the effects that we call interference. So even, the, again, the particles behave like waves. There is no traje classical trajectory. I remind you that Aristotle said that the time is the number of the movement, the number of the trajectory, that you measure a trajectory. If you don't have a trajectory, how do you measure time? And in fact, it's very difficult to define time in, the, in, the, in quantum mechanics. You don't have what it's in the jargon. It's called an operator. Then, it's another thing which is very funny too. Feynman, when, uh, when he tried to explain all that, he said that, if you have two points, the passage, the particle, does not just go from one point to the other. It takes all the possible points with some probability. And by adding all these probabilities, this is what you get, the probability to get a particle from one place to the other. I usually explain this with the effect of the Orient Express. If you have uh, read the Orient Express from Agatha Christie, there's not only one murderer, they are all murderers. So they all go and kill at the same time. So this is what happens also with particles. And they go each from with, with some probability, and the sum of these possibilities gives you the transition. Furthermore, comes a very interesting thing by Heisenberg that you, is very interesting because you will see it will open the, the virtual, it will open the possibility to create the universe, as you will see. It says, we can never know with infinite precision the position and the momentum of a particle. We cannot know with uh, infinite precision its energy and its time. When I was young and uh, in a, a funny mood, we would say that these were the sentimental problems of Heisenberg. Whenever he had the energy, he did not have the time, and when he had the time, he did not have the energy. Okay, forget about it, it's a little bit shocking. So, uh, then, immediately afterwards, comes Dirac, who tries to marry the two things, relativity and quantum mechanics. And when you marry them, the equation are such that ask something that has negative energy. And they said, what is this thing that has negative energy? The, the formula, the third formula, I'm sorry, that I'm showing here, is there in order to tell you 
it's if you take momentum p to zero, it's equal e equals m c m c square that everybody knows. Now this formula says that there can be solutions positive and negative, and the question is in physics if something is there, it's like the Swiss law. I mean, if whatever is permitted is obligatory, so it was permitted to have negative energies. It must be. It's a joke again. I'm sorry. <laughs> so the question is. If it is uh, permitted, what it is? So this is when the Dirac said that this probably corresponds to antiparticles. And actually Feynman said that probably these antiparticles are like particles that go backwards in time. It's the same thing to say that antiparticle goes like that or an antiparticle that goes like that from behind. Therefore, antimatter came in. And this is very important, as you will see, because then one more thing, and I will tell you why it is very important. Then, now, particles would exchange, as we said in the beginning, photons to interact. Whatever is called interaction is exchange of a particle, as if you had two boys, let's say, in two boats, that each one throws a ball to the other. If the one, thro the one that throws the boat goes by inertia, goes this, this way, and the other one that receives it also goes this way. This is how it happens in physics, but we exchange what we call messengers, physics messengers, and these are, we call them bosons, forget why we call them. There is a problem with time here, but I don't think they have the time to tell you about it. But what comes now, which is very important, and if you understand this, you will, I think you will understand what I will have to say at the end. Now, we, you remember the energy-time re relationship by Heisenberg. It says the following thing. The energy-time relationship by Heisenberg says that for some small time, delta t, you can violate the conservation of energy, delta e, provided that their product is less than some number, the constant of Heisenberg. Therefore, suddenly, the vacuum can be a bubbling vacuum. That is, vacuum for us is the minimum energy state. You can suddenly have pairs, because before you could never create a single particle. But if you have the antiparticle, particle and antiparticle have charge and anti-charge, their charge is zero. So before is zero, after is zero, no problem with the charge conservation. So for, from time to time, or all the time, you have the vacuum bubbling particles and antiparticles. They last for a little time, as it is permitted by their energy, and they are reabsorbed. So it, it becomes a thrusting, you know, vacuum becomes a, a champagne place. I mean, it's like bubbles of particles coming all the time. Furthermore, the most important thing is that when I interact with you, we excite the vacuum, and the vacuum excites all the possibilities, all the virtual. And we excite, for instance, particles that we have not detected yet. And this is what happened three times already. It happened when we discovered the quark charm, we when we discovered the top uh, uh, quark, and what we discovered recently, the Higgs. That is, you measure, you measure with a lot of precision an interaction of some particles, and you can also calculate through all this virtual, you remember Feynman, what I said, the Orient Express and all that. When you calculate all the virtualities, all the possibilities, what remains is a particle you have not seen yet. And you say, aha, there is a particle there, I have to increase the energy to go and see it. It is fantastic, I don't know if you understand. If you meet someone, and when you meet someone, all the possible things that you can do with him in the future determine the quality of your relationships, if I try to make a sort of human example. This is what we see now. It's so precise, our theory. It's 10 to the minus 10. It's very, very precise. So I told you about the, the vacuum. And this is very important, because from the vacuum will come the Big Bang. And it is a very similar process. It will be an emergence of particles and antiparticles that will come. And I said all, whatever I just told you. And here, again, let's, since a philosophy place, Empedocle and Parmenides were very bright people. They said, the universe is eternal because if a particle ever appeared, the principle of sufficient reason would say, why this particle should be born 
here and not there, and why at this moment and not a, a future moment. The fact that you cannot, the principle of sufficient reason does not permit you to accept that something just is born there, makes you to say, therefore, nothing is born, nothing changes for Parmenides. Here, we have the first mechanism that says, no, the vacuum is bubbling with probabilities, and these, prob these virtual particles, and these virtual particles, at some point, as it happened, can go in such a way that will create the universe. So this is philosophically very, f I mean, I, the length of my talk does not permit me to go further, but I think it's a very important, you see that when you do physics, you also uh, address old philosophical problems. So it's not only the photons, we know now that we have four interactions. There is what it is called weak interaction, which is radioactivity, again by exchange of particles that we call bosons with names like W and Z, and the strong interaction that keeps the nucleus together, and you have gravity. And all of this we want to unify someday. We believe that there is only one kind of uh, force, and this is what we want to do. The three is easy to do. Unify the subatomic forces, strong, electromagnetic, and weak, with gravity is a difficult task. So this is where we are today. We, matter is made of quarks, U, down, up, down, charm, strange, Tom, bottom. What we call leptons, electron, muon, tau, etc., neutrinos, and the forces. And we discover them one by one as time went through. We still have a lot of open questions, which I will not uh, touch here like that. Then, there is the last ingredient to understand the, under, the subatomic uh, world, and we go into cosmology. What I call the physics of an instant, which is the transition of phase. You have very often, you know transition of phase. Transition of phase is what water becomes ice, or water becomes steam, and even Thales, for instance, thought that this is the whole world, that it is sort of transition from one to the other. In our particle of physics, we still have this. We still have transition of phase. We go from some, what we call potential in our modern world, we roll from one state to another, and this suddenly changes the order of things. And essentially, our universe, as it was born, changed exactly orders, the order changed through very, very uh, abrupt events, which we call them uh, transitions of phase. And the first transition of phase, which I will not go a lot to, is the one of the Higgs particle. Normally, the photon in the famous W and Z should, not be, should be all without mass. And all, the theory we had was that everything should be without mass. And then someone discovered that you can keep the first symmetry, that everything is symmetric. You have a unified uh, force, and the unified would be at the top of this, what we call a Mexican hat below. And as the universe expanded, and the temperature went down below, suddenly the potential changed form, as you see in the second, the, the second above, change form, and the, what was the minimum, it was not anymore the minimum, the minimum was somewhere else. And this, this broke the symmetry on one side, but on the other hand gave mass to the particles. The example that you can give is the example of a pen sending on its nose, which is very symmetric, but the slightest push will make it lose its symmetry because it will not be symmetric in rotation, but will point to direction, but will be more stable. This is what happened in the universe, and it happened again and again. The prototype is this, what we call the Higgs, but it can be many more. Okay. Then, things that we have not done yet, but I will not go, yeah, probably I should go that. In the same way that we saw that top and bottom and uh, the Higgs through the virtual exchanges exist, but we have not seen them yet, we believe that there are types of symmetry, uh, particles, this is ho how I got my famous prize, an infamous prize, very little. Uh, it's the supersymmetry. Supersymmetry is, as we said with antiparticles, we need our theory, 
in order to be complete, needs these particles, which are called supersymmetric particles, and we believe these days that these are the famous dark matter that I just told you, the matter that does not shine that we saw in a few slides below. And this is looked at very actively next to here, Gran Sasso. In Gran Sasso we have detectors, and we hope to see particles of dark matter in the universe interacting with our detectors, go hitting our detectors, raising slightly their temperature. These are called xenon, uh, and then there is another one called dark side, and all that. And we go, why do we go to Gran Sasso? Why go below the, you know, in a cavern? Because we want to cut the, ra the cosmic rays that traverse everything and which are usually not letting us see rare events. This is one thing, and the other thing we also can do with supersymmetry is we believe that as all the forces of the electromagnetism, the force, the strong force and the weak force is are uh, uh, sort of changing with energy, that they can be unified at some point and they become only one force. This we will see a little bit further what I mean by that. If they and this is something else that we also look very actively in underground detectors. Let me come now to the cosmology part for the last 20 minutes. Let me see. Because I, it was too fast. Okay. In order to make you understand what I want to say with all this, let me uh, make an example from the first cosmology. The first cosmology, we think, is by Pythagoras. Pythagoras is a very nice story. Pythagoras passed outside a uh, Hammersmith place, uh, Ferraio, F F F Ferraio? And he heard people, the, f f the Ferrailleur, the people hitting with their hammers, and there was harmony. And he entered there and he said, why is harmony? Why harmony is coming? And he's making it, made, made, made a lot of uh, ex uh, experiments. He said, you change, you take this hammer and you hit it. And then, and then he discovered, and the reason that this, uh, there was harmony is that the weight of all the hammers had, had special ratios. Then he went back home and he, did, he made an example with strings. And he discovered that when you hit it, it worked, it doesn't work anymore. Well, anyway, when you split the, the string in half, you have the octave. Then in three-fourths, you have a harmony of three-fourths. I have to double-click. Ah, yeah. No, it's, unfortunately, it doesn't work. I don't know for some reason. Maybe because the presentation is a little one. If I make it, ah, in a closed one. Ah, I see what you mean. But how do that? You can double click and play it on the right. Ah. Well, here. Right, a ah, yes, here. Okay. Yes. This one. So, can do. This is one. This is the octave, the three fourths. And then again. And this is the fourth, and this is the fifth, the appended in Greek. And then you do them all together, and you have the harmony. Okay? So he said, Pythagoras said, look, first of all, number is behind harmony. Second, my soul likes this harmony, therefore my soul is number. So he included not only the macrocosm, also the microcosm, and he was very happy. I want to tell you that what we, we discovered the harmonies of the world. That's what we also did. I mean, this ever since this was the big, the big uh, search. Kepler tried to do it. Handel, if you know, there is a Hammersmith, a famous Hammersmith. Everybody was looking for that, and this is how it, how it happened. First of all, we had. Uh, we have Gamow. That said. If everything is going to denser and denser situation, sometime it was so close that it was a plasma of an ionized plasma. Protons and electrons were free going all around, 
And as the universe expanded, it cooled down, the protons found the electrons, and then it became neutral. You see that in the green and the red. And therefore, then, the photons that were also mingled in this plasma went away, and we have to detect these photons. They must be coming from there, and we can see them, because the fact that they traveled all the time, and because of relativity effects, they are radio waves. You can find them in radio waves. And this is what Penzias and Wilson did. They found them. They found them. It's a, a lot of funny stories. I don't have the time to tell. And you also see them if you do not have a, a plasma screen. <laughs> if you had the old screen, the old screen, you don't have a cable TV. I'm sorry. And you, you also ca capture when you don't look at a specific station in the noise. You have this cosmic noise coming from the beginning of the universe. And that was a very important thing. Second thing that he did. I don't have the time to go through it. He said, even if I go even more dense, I have the conditions at the interior of the sun. Therefore, I will create nuclei. So I can predict how many nuclei exist in the universe, or what fraction of nuclei exist in the universe, because I can say when they were created. And then you had very little time to do it, because you were in a very dense, uh, uh, dense region, and the universe were expanding, expanding, and you had to use the neutron. And the neutron, when it is alone, has only nine minutes of life. So in nine minutes, were created the first nuclei. This is called primordial, uh, primordial uh, uh, nucleosynthesis. Then came nine, 1993. This is the Nobel Prize of uh, my friend George Smoot. We said that when Jesse Wilson saw the full universe, this radiation coming from all over this place, and it was uniform. It didn't change at all if you looked this way or this way or the other way. But then they increased the sensitivity and the resolution of their machine, and they finally discovered this. The red line in the middle is the, radios, the radio waves that come from the galaxy, which are other things. But if you take away this, what do you find? You find small differences of temperature, very small differences of temperature. You can see it through the difference of it because it's a black, uh, it's a black uh, body. Differences of, uh, of uh, energy is a sort of differences of temperature down there. And these are, we believe strongly, the small changes in density that were at the origin of the creation of galaxies. That is, you had a random effect. You had more density, less density. And where you have more density, gravity falls in and creates galaxies and the suns and us all. So they found these anisotropies, as they are called, that we believe were the beginning of the universe. And started a big program, a lot of of, uh, sorry, a lot of experiments. Kobe was the first experiment to do that. Then it was another one called W. Map and Planck with higher and higher precision. I have the last one. Planck was last year gave us its results. And nothing works. Well, I don't want to do that. Now, I wanted to tell you what is it? What is this thing? This. this. It is the story of the Hammersmiths. It is the Big Bang. We are hearing the Big Bang. Why? You know very well that when you hit something, if you hit a bell, you will hit a different, listen to a different noise from when you hit an office or you hit your head. And the thing depends on the geometry of the thing and what it contains. So when you see that, you ex essentially see the ripples that created the Big Bang in the beginning of time, and how they evolved to create these densities. So by looking at that, you are looking at the seeds of creation of universe. And then what you can do is you can, of course, analyze harmonically, as you do harmonic analysis of whatever you do in, in music, uh, along the different harmonies, but this is in space harmony, not in, in time. And by making this harmonic analysis, you have a plot of these harmonics 
that tell you many things. They tell you what is the, the geometry of the universe, and we know now that it is flat. It can tell you what it contains, and we know you find again that it contains dark matter and photons and neutrinos and the exact number of protons and neutrons that you found before with the nucleosynthesis. And you can do many other things with it. So by simply looking at these riddles, these ripples of time, you can understand, as I said, that it is Euclidean. And also, for instance, if I, if I change, nothing works in here. But the differences of uh, the differences of uh, uh, of this uh, anal harmonic analysis can tell you how much dark energy you have, how much dark matter, etc. So it is a big thing of study, and we came now to, to believe that after Planck, the density of and the, of matter energy in the universe it is of the order of five percent of known matter, the matter, the quarks, the leptons we said. Then there is 27% of dark matter, which we don't know, probably is supersymmetry, we don't know. And the other 68% is what we call dark energy, that it could be the cosmological constant, but again, we don't know. So this is the riddle that uh, uh, Smoot was saying about. Now, very fast, even faster than what I said up to now, was up to now, let's go to the first seconds. We didn't finish. We were at the nuclei. Well, nuclei, or no, we were, when protons and neutrons made nuclei. What did make protons and neutrons? Protons and neutrons were made by quarks, these little particles called quarks. They again went through a phase transition. These phase transitions that you change suddenly as water changes to ice, they go, and then we are actively looking for that in Alice in uh, LHC. Then we can, we have, uh, I'm sorry, came another transition. We said that from the bubbles of the universe, equal, mat equal amounts of matter and antimatter was produced. But if you look around you, you will find that there's only matter. The antimatter has gone. You can produce it in, uh, in accelerators. We know, how well, you can see it in the cosmic rays. But it has gone. Sometime, the universe from symmetric in matter, antimatter. If it was symmetric in matter, antimatter, there would be no structure, because matter meets antimatter, annihilate. So therefore, it would be no structure at all. So at some point, something, a click, uh, another change of phase, made that only matter came. And this was, I mean, out of 100 billion matter and 100 billion and one antimatter, or the inversely, only one quark remained, and from it came us. This is another uh, uh, change that happened, which we know of. Then finally, the last thing I, hope I want to say, and then I will stop, is inflation. Inflation is the process that created these little over densities that we said. And this was created finally, we believe now, we are very excited till since uh, two weeks, 17th of March, we think we discovered uh, the mechanism of inflation. We may started to discover the mechanism of inflation. And why did not we want inflation? Inflation we wanted because in the Big Bang problem we had a few problems. One problem was the fact of horizon. I will tell you what it is about it. The fact that the universe is flat and forget all the rest. Problem of horizon. You see here that the fluctuations of temperature are very, very small. But if you, ah, nothing works. No, I will do something else, I'm sorry. Because I do. No. Charge, Tres, Pajer, Tres, Diaporama. No, not this. Ah, he doesn't want me to. No, 
She doesn't accept it. Sorry for that. Anyway. Inflation is the following thing. Inflation is what I just told you. Inflation is in, the, in this bubbling vacuum, as it happened, we, were, we started in this potential at some point, and what happened is that the universe expanded much faster than what, uh, that what uh, it was permitted by, let's say, relativity at the, at the time, and made in such a way things that thermal, the whole universe, I'm, so, I'm sorry because I'm, without having the tools to show to you, it's very difficult to explain to you. Anyway, so let me, since I feel the pressure of time on my, on my uh, and that's why I'm sorry I lost it. And the, the story is the following. What we discovered this uh, last, uh, I will go to that and go very slowly to the end. Uh, we discovered that the imprints, not only of acoustic waves that were created, these waves of matter that wave when the Big Bang started, but we discovered the gravitational waves that were propagated, that is the formation of space and time that were propagated, and they gave a special imprint, they give a different imprint if they are simply uh, acoustical waves and different if they are gravitational waves. And for the first time we measured, we, we've seen what is inflation. We've seen something that we believe is inflation. Now, these gravitational waves, we're also looking at them not very far from here. And, and this is in Pisa, in, in the famous Virgo uh, gravitational wave antenna. And uh, we will study them in the space in the, in the antenna called LISA. And we, will, we hope that in the future, in uh, LISA and LIGO, we will, will be followed by other experiments, one in PISA called ET and another one in space called BBO, and we'll even be able to directly detect these gravitational waves. Okay, going now, the three last slides before the... the this process of inflation that created these bubbles that created and formed the Big Bang, probably they are not finished, and they can, uh, they can also come in the future. And for instance, you have one of the people that created the, the theory of inflation, Linde, that proposes another scheme which you will not be able to see. It's, it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary. I'm sorry. I don't want it to be like that. I will go out, sorry for that. I will go out, I just want to show you these last things and I, I will finish. as you said, like that. Yes. Okay. So it can happen that in the longest, the longest ways of time, you can have this inflation, this process in the world, in the universe, starting again and again. And by, if you put different colors in the different regions of the world that this will be created, you can have what is called the Kandinsky universe. And uh, that's one, uh, uh, I mean, very nice thing that I wanted to show you, but unfortunately I don't have the time to do it. And the other thing that can happen again is the following, that you can have inflation. Inflation now is believed in you, if you take this new theory of, of, uh, of uh, uh, strings, you believe that our universe, what you see, 
as our universe is not the full universe, that there is the famous multi-universe where you have many others, and one, our universe is just one of these things. And all these things go together with inflation. So in order to make a long story short, let me go to my last slide. What I promised to you, some link with what I told you and time. This is, the, this, this is historically the first philosophical fragment we found. It is by Anaximander and says the following. It is neither water on, or any of the other elements, but a substance different from this, which is infinite, apiron, or in for, in for, without form. Apiron is both infinite and without form, from which come all the skies and the cosmos. Inflation. And the, and the things go back to, the, to where they came as it is written, because they give reparation and satisfaction one to the other a long time. So this is, you see two things here, according to me. The first thing is the, that the only way to stop the eternal sequence of questions, this was that, and before that, what was it? And before that, what was it? And before, is to say that something was completely symmetric. If something is completely symmetric, Anaximander himself said that. You don't have to explain it. You don't, he said, the Earth is in the middle of the world because it doesn't have anywhere else to go. So if it is completely symmetric, you don't have to explain. And at some point, you fall from this case of symmetry to something asymmetric. And this is what we call the spontaneous breaking of symmetry. Second, time can be defined not with respect to some eternal clock. Plato says it is. Time is the mobile image of eternity along the number, which is a beautiful poetic phrase, but still it's related to the fact that you have something that turns around you and defines the year. But times is described as a, as a, as a, a deviation with respect to equilibrium. And this is how you measure time, deviation with respect to equilibrium. And with this, uh, Thank you. Has anybody a question? If you don't want, I have a question. Yes. Uh, you say that if there are 10 billion particles of antimatter, there, is 10 there are 10 billion and one yes. particles matter. of matter. And it means that the law of the conservation of charge is wrong, or it yeah, means well, that they were 10 billion and 10 billion and one survive. I'm a little yes, confused. Yes, it, it is some, some of the interactions, this is, I didn't have time to talk about, some of the interactions do not, you do not have decay, equal decay to particles and antiparticles. So some of the particles are preponderant. You in the decay of these particles, and this is co is actually it has a very profound uh, uh, reason, and it is related actually to violation of what we call the time symmetry going forward and forth. You need the violation of time of symmetry to create some particles and other particles different, and this is what happens. And we have theories for that, with, related to the neutrinos, related to the neutrinos. Okay. Sorry if it was a little bit, uh, I was planning, I saw that the previous uh, times it was a little bit more relaxed in time and it was a little bit more material that I would, uh, so at the end I went a little bit fast, I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. <laughs>